the Word, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. If you'd stand with me this morning as I read to you the opening text. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to read to verse 5. John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and watch this, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we thank you, Lord God, for revealing to us what John penned down for us to see today who is truly the living word, the spoken word, the revealed word of God. We thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord. Now we ask God that you'll fill us with your spirit as your word goes forth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we're going to be talking about the Word today, and it just so happens, you know, God plans everything, and I believe everything has a plan, because if God's in it, it will always come about the way He says. And so with the advent of Christmas, it's, it's amazing. I just, it boggles my mind how quick Christmas comes every year. In fact, the older I get, it seems like the quicker it comes. Right. Amen. Thank you all for saying that and agreeing with me because I felt like I was the only one sometimes. But uh, it, it, just, it just happens to be that way. But then, you know, we think about Christmas, and over the years we think about the meaning of Christmas. And I've heard so many people over the years talk about how Christmas is not what it used to be. Uh, Christmas has, in the advent of Christmas and all the things that happen around Christmas time, the giving and the families and, you know, there are a lot of things going on, the food, the eating and all this other stuff. Uh, there is some, some commercialism. It seems like somehow or another it's gotten lost in the focus or the word Christmas has become watered down. Well, you know, over time, words do change and lose meaning. In fact, uh, Annie Cru Crusar and in, his, in the book that said 20 words that once meant something very different, said words change meaning over time in ways that might surprise you, and then he gives a few examples of what that might be. One of the words he used, the very first one, was nice, N-I-C-E. The word used to mean silly, foolish, simple, far from the compliment it is today. Secondly, the word silly. Meanwhile, silly went in the opposite direction, and the earliest uses it referred to, to, to things worthy or blessed. From there it came to refer to the weak and the vulnerable, and more recently, to those who are foolish. The word awful also has a different meaning, I had, or it did at one time. Awful things used to be Worthy of all, for a variety of reasons, which is how we get expressions like the awful majesty of God. You don't hear that, do you? How about fizzle? The, word, the verb fizzle, fizzle, F-I-Z-Z-L-E, once referred to the act of producing quite flatulence. <laughs> American college slang flipped the word's meaning to refer to failing at things. How about clue? Centuries ago, a clue or clue was a ball of yarn. Think about threading your way through a maze and you see how you got from yarn to key bits of evidence that help us solve things. Naughty. Long ago, if you were naughty, you had naught or nothing. Then it came to mean evil or immoral. And now you are just badly behaved. It's kind of like, you know, to tell a lie today is, no, so you're just misspoken. 
How about Guy? G-U-I. It comes from the name of Guy Fawkes, who was part of a failed attempt to blow up Parliament in 1605. Folks used to burn his effigy at Guy Fawkes, or a guy, and from there it came to refer to a frightful future, or a frightful figure. In the U.S. it has come to refer to men in general. And you know what else I found? It also refers to women. You know how they say, see you guys later, and there's a bunch of women standing there? Well, words have lost meaning in some areas. Words have gained meaning in some areas, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. But now John, of course, again, remember, on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is going to pin down what he learned concerning this one particular word, and that is the word. Now, he's going to explain, unlike the other Gospels, he gets right into the subject matter of who it is that he wants to tell people about. And you know, a lot of times when you think of a word, you think of something, like for instance, you might think of a, a clock. You know, you say the word clock, and then automatic in your mind, you're thinking, okay, a clock on the wall, or a watch, or a chair. You know, automatically it associates with something that is descriptive in your mind that you've already been exposed to. But how in the world are you going to explain something or someone to someone else that they've never seen before or have never known before? And you're going to have to use a word to do it. So he's going to use a word that was apparent and very, very widely used in that day, and he's going to use the word, the person of a word, in verses 1 and 2. And he's going to start by saying this, in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning was the word. Now, I believe that's where you start, right? You don't start in the back of the book. You start at the beginning of the book. And so that's what, exactly what he says. He cuts the chase and he says, In the beginning was the Word. Or from the very beginning of creation, the Word, Jesus Christ, was there. <laughs> now, he goes all the way back to the beginning of the book. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and all these Jews knew that. They knew that beginning. They knew what it said in the very first verse when it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we know God created everything, right? Except there's still not a whole lot of disclosure here about the person he's trying to reveal. Of course, he is Jesus Christ. But he sets the stage because no one was there when God created, right? How many of you were ever there? How many of you had a say in what you saw or whatever you, you know, whenever you saw God just, you know, just create everything? Well, none of us were there. So it's going to be quite difficult to prove to someone that God created everything. Although, you know what? God doesn't need our help to prove that he created everything. Nor does he need any assurance from anybody to say, oh, I'm so glad God created everything. He doesn't need us to say that. All we need to know, and all what John is saying here is this, in the beginning was the Word. Now, if you notice in your Bible, it's a capital W. So he's making a point about who this Word is. So let's look at defining the word, word. I don't want to confuse you now, but the one thing you've got to understand is that when he's talking about a word, he's describing a person. So in classical Greek, word or the word logos, and they understood what that word meant, is defined as reason or thought. It is when thought or speech are unquestionably brought together and understood. And as I use that little small illustration, we talked about, you know, when I say, when I say fire truck, every child in this room is going to know what a fire truck looks like, right? Red, 
carries water, got firemen on there, and they're out there to, to help the public survive. So everybody understands that. That concept in your mind is academic. You already know what that means. But it's kind of hard to describe when you talk about Logos, or you're talking about a person, and you're describing this person as the Word. So let's look at a few biblical examples of what is taught concerning the Word. Now that's where we're going to go for our text. I'm not going to go to any other source other than the Bible. Proverbs 4.4 4 says, He taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commands and live. So here is the father figure speaking to the son, and he's saying, Listen to my what? Words. Because they'll do what? They will bring you life. Another example we find in the, and there's a lot more in Proverbs, because Proverbs is a great book as a parent to teach your children. And of course, you just don't want to teach them that. You want to live that out in front of them. But Matthew 10, 14 says, and if anyone, this is Jesus speaking, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. So the words he's talking about are the words from the scriptures, the words that bring life. And then and also in Luke 4.22 says, And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And who are they talking about? Jesus. And here's what they said. Is not this Joseph's son? So the words they used to speak and inter interchange among one another were words about a person about who this person was. What was his identity? Where did he come from? Now another marvelous passage of Scripture is, is John chapter 14, verses 22 to 20, 23 to 24. And Jesus is speaking here, and he says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make, make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So here was the word speaking on behalf of the Father, the Father's words. So what? So people would understand. Where did these words originate from? Well, John is telling us right here in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. So the Word was always there. Now the beginning is not so much to say, well, when the earth was created, then that's when He came into existence. No, no. No, no. He's always been there. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But He's always been there. So He's wanting His readers to understand this word that he's referring to is the Logos, is the one that you will understand who he is once you come into contact with his words. You see how blessed of people we are? We have the Holy Scriptures before us. And at one time they, they didn't have the words pinned down. And the understanding that we have today in our English language, wow, that just sets us apart. So there would be no mistaking here, or, mis or making a mistake, mistaking, mistaking, the fact that what he's referring to and who he's referring to was the one who was from the beginning, and that is the Word, Jesus Christ. Second point, let me just read this off to you about what Albert Barnes defines the Word he says, by saying it, it is that by which we communicate our will, by which we convey our thoughts, or by that which we issue commands. The medium of communication with others. And I like that definition. But I also like what John also says when it comes to the word, to define what it meant. In verse 14, some of you memorized this verse. And it's so, it fits the season so well because it takes away from what everybody else might be thinking outside of what the Bible talks about concerning what the Word really is. And he says, And the Word became flesh. Now, y'all all know what flesh is, right? So we can't make any kind of assumptions about that. 
And he says, and they, and dwelt among us. Now, who's the word again? Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So here's John telling his readers, here's who this, here, 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 here's the word, here's who he is. He's the one who was made flat flesh. He was wrapped in flesh that you might know, that you might see, and you might also do this. You might also behold his glory. Now, I can't tell you, as we're going to go through the book of John, we're going to see how Jesus impacted so many lives, but yet there were so many more lives, and even though they saw him and walked with him, hadn't had a clue who he was. That's why they call it the gospel of belief. Because you're going to find, as we read through the gospel narrative, there were so many people who did not believe. There were more people who did not believe who he was, despite the fact that they had, they had revealed knowledge of who the word was. So that proves this point. Because you may be super intelligent, you're probably the one who's going to miss it more than anybody else. Because, let me just say this. How can something that is invisible wrap itself in flesh? How could someone who is perfectly holy come to a sinful earth and, and dwell among sinners and at the same time remain sinless and dwell among a people who is resistant and rebellious and bitterly hatred toward him. Now, you know what? <laughs> All I can say is the grace of God that he came. Otherwise, taking it from a human understanding, why would you even associate with the lowly and the despicable and the depraved since your place is in heaven in all glory. But that's exactly what he did. And, and, and it's all as all John is having a hallelujah moment. And he just can't wait to tell other people. But you know what I find so disheartening is the fact that people know this. The fact that they know that they know. They reject it even more so. It's one of these things that I can't explain. Any more than John couldn't explain it any better than he put it down here in verse 14. Well, let's go on. So as he continues to explain the word, so where was the word all this time? You can't see it. I'm speaking words right now. You can't see my words coming out, right? But where was the word? Talking about Jesus, where was the word? And he, said, he tells us, and notice, and the word was with God. <laughs> Now, to try to get a little more understanding here, and I, and, I, and I wrote this verse down just the way it came out of the Bible, first part of verse 1, second part of verse 1. But let's compare it with verse 18. John 1, 18. So if you're right there in John 1, look at verse 18. It says, no one has ever seen God. So let's just say this. All right, I'm going to throw this out at you. How many of you have ever seen God before? And, and in fact, in Jewish circles, they say that if you ever saw God, you would die. So how would it be possible to say that you saw God, and yet he walked among us, and that now John is saying no one has ever seen God? Who is he talking about? The invisible God. This God, the God who is spirit. No one's ever seen him. Well, watch this. The only God who is at the right side, he has made him no, in other words, he exegetes him. He reveals him. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the word. We're doing an association, right? Words have meaning. They associate with something or someone or some place. Because the minute you say, you know exactly what it is. This is what John is trying to accomplish here. He's trying to say to his readers, this Logos 
which you've never seen before, now has been revealed through this person, and his name is Jesus Christ. The preposition with is not the kind that we might use or associate to express that I am with some object or a thing, but rather with depicts someone in fellowship or in communion with another. And who's he talking about? He's talking about the Trinity here. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are in complete, perfected unity with one another. This is what he's talking about. It's not like saying there's a chair in a room and the chair's there, okay? So the chair is with us, it's in our presence. But I have no fellowship with that chair. If I did, y'all could just call the ambulance, have them come pick me up and bring me to Pineville. <laughs> no, he's talking about a, a holy union between God the Father and Jesus Christ. Perfect unity, perfect power. Perfect holiness and identity. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Then God <coughs> said, So if God's going to say something, He's going to do what? He's going to speak what? Words, right? Okay, these words He's talking about, He's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then God said, let us make man in our image, let our, after our likeness, and let us, or let them, have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Remember what he said? Let us. Who do you think represents the us? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He could have said, let me God, right? No, 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 no. He said, let us. So guess who was there? Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Because if you read the opening chapter in Genesis, you find out all three are there. All three are there before the, life, the, earth, the earth had life or form. Before the heavens created. In fact, there was just darkness. There was nothing that existed that existed unless God spoke it into existence. And who was there? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, uh, in fact, let's just turn. You have your Bibles? Just start turning to the right. John, 1 John. Let's see some interesting scriptures here. 1 John, uh, where are we at? Chapter 2. 1 through 6. Listen to what John, same writer, listen to what he says. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Advocate. Advocate? Who's that advocate? With the Father. He tells us, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ the righteous he is the propitiation. The word propitiation simply means this. And I just love, I love simple definitions. It means someone who satisfied the wrath of God. Jesus Christ became that propitiation. In fact, when he was hanging on the cross, that's exactly what he became. He was exposed and endured the wrath of God on our behalf. For what? For our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, if, you know what? Some might use that as an Armenian or universal position and say, well, you see that? That means everybody's going to heaven. No, that's not what, that's not what it means. Because, because let me just say this. Hell would have never been created. And there would not be people in hell today. No. It's whosoever would repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, therefore becoming regenerated and now receiving the Holy Spirit of God in their lives, they are different and forever changed, have now received the righteousness of God, what only comes through Jesus Christ. They're the only folks who will go to heaven. Otherwise, 
If that hadn't happened, the gener regeneration that the Bible talks about, through the washing of the Word and through Christ, without Jesus Christ, without His mediation, without the advocate, Jesus Christ, we'd all be in trouble because there would be no salvation. However, we have people walking topside. You walk among them all day long who have no regeneration, who are not born again, who could care less about what the Word of God says pertaining to its truth and live a life diametrically opposed to the Scriptures. Jesus said, listen, you can tell me you love me until the cows come home, but the question is, do you obey what I say? Do you obey me? You say you love me, but what is that? And watch what he says in verse 3. And by this we know, so you see again, God doesn't want anybody in the dark. He wants us all to know that we have come to know him who's him, that's Jesus, if we keep his commands. So when you think about the Ten Commandments, let's just use that. How many of those have you broken? <laughs> Yeah, if, you, if people were truly honest, they would say, you know what, I broke them all. But you know, in the, in the light of the fact that people might say they broke even one or nine of them or six of them or whatever, you know, when James talks about if you break one, you broke them all, you know, if we're truly honest with ourselves, the fact is that you might know that. A lot of times people will say, you know, so what? I don't care. I, let me just say this. I used to think the same way. I don't care about the Ten Commandments. I don't care about God's laws. You see, that tells you what's in your heart. What's your attitude towards those commandments? Now, you know you can't keep them. Because what? The law will bring judgment. Because of what? Because of sin. There's nothing wrong with the commandments. However, no one can keep the commandments. So, the best alternative to escape that judgment... It's what he's talking about here. Run to the one who became your propitiation, who took the wrath of God on your behalf. But let me just say this. Without repentance, there can be no salvation. And without salvation, there can be no repentance. So verse 4 says, So, what, so, so whoever says, I know him, in other words, I know Jesus, but does not keep his commandments, is a court blanche liar and the truth is not in him now you know I I pray for our leadership in this country uh, you know I praise God for this country on which it stands and how it was developed you know with all the he's and the haws and the ups and the downs and the failures and the blowouts and everything else you know this country's it's still solvent for I don't know how long but you know think, think about this despite the fact of all the hatred Every day that goes on in Congress, in the Senate, in the White House. You don't hear too much about the Supreme Court, but there's some in there too. Despite the fact of all of this that's happening today, how many of those are actually saying to others that they are Christians? That's all I, that's all I want to say. The fact that you say you're a Christian, how is it that you can say... When one says, okay, if you're a Christian, you must know him, right? You must know Christ. He says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly, the love of God is perfected. Now, just because a person quotes scripture doesn't make him a Christian. There are a lot of people who profess scriptures, and boy, they, but all the while, on the same token, they have hatred towards their fellow man. Some would even be boldly enough to say, oh, I can't do that because my religion won't let me say it. It's almost a double standard, isn't it? Out of one mouth, you say this, and out of another mouth, you say that, or the same side of that mouth. I don't know. But by looking from the Scriptures, he says, by this we may be sure that we are in him, that's Jesus, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 
So John here is on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit wanted his readers to understand there must be a different way of living once you come into contact with the Logos who is the Word made flesh your life will be entirely transformed and different forever. This won't just be words just coming out freely to just say it. No, there will be a life to go along with that. So this word, as John continues to expound on it, he says, you know, the question would be, for me to say, would be, who is the Word? Okay, I hear about Jesus, but who is the Word? Well, he says, and the Word was God. We could stop right there and close our books and go home. If every person would understand who the Word is, John says, at the end of that verse, verse 1, he says, and the Word was God. He didn't say a God. He said he was God. He is God. He is in the beginning with God. So he goes all the way back to Genesis, who this Word is. So, questions. Who is Arius? Some of you might know who he is. Maybe some of you may not know. It, it, let me just say this from the very beginning. If he, would have, if he would have gotten his way in the early part of the church where he at one time believed that Jesus Christ could not be God. And he had a huge impact on a lot of folks and leading them away. In fact, to this day, his work continues in the Mormons, in the Jehovah Witness, in their movement. But just think, he was in the movement of the Christianity movement in that particular time. Well, what about this guy? Who was poorly called? He's not the guy you used to see on Channel 3 or with a Channel 10. <laughs> I always wonder, who, the, who, the, who would name a guy poorly called? But he's one of the early church fathers, and just a little bit about him. Uh, he was martyred simply because he wouldn't burn incense to the Roman leader. So they did, they burned him at the stake, and he wouldn't die. He was on fire, and he wouldn't die, as the tradition had said, and they stuck a, a sword in him to finish him off. Why? Because he wouldn't bow a knee to the emperor. He only bowed a knee to Jesus Christ because he knew who he was. He was the Word made flesh. So when we say, who is Jesus Christ? You know what? It has permeated our society from leaps and bounds for generations. And to this day, people still don't know who he is. If they knew who he was, their lives would be different, totally transformed. Preaching would be popular today. Those who preach according to the word. Again, I read that verse to you. John 1.18. Let I me mean, read it again and I'll read a few more. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him no. John, Hebrews chapter, let's, I'll turn there to you, for you. In Hebrews chapter 1, I love this, I love this passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 1, there's several passages of Scriptures. We're not sure who the author of Hebrews is, but for the most part, I really think he's probably the Apostle Paul, but that's just my opinion. In verse 1, he says, Long ago and many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, that's Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact, it's not a play on words, just like you have on your desktop, you have these little, what we call icons, 
This is the next word he's going to use, an icon. So whenever you click onto that icon, or whatever that is on your desktop or your phone or whatever, you know that in that, behind that icon or in that icon is whatever information or whatever it is you're tapping into is going to be behind there. Exactly what it is you're looking for. He's making that same point known in this word, imprint, the icon, the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So again, who is this Jesus Christ? The writer of Hebrews is telling, him, telling us that he's exactly like God. And he was the one who created all things and put it into existence. This same person, the Word, the Logos, who walked among us 2,000 years ago. And I, I know, I hear the skeptic, you've you never seen Jesus. Well, i got something for you in just a minute. But, but, but the Word of God, which again is, is God's truth, that's what Jesus said, he says, there's no other truth but what is God's Word. God's Word is truth. Reveals to us who He is. And there's no other source that we can rely on. Substantially to say, and definitively, and objectively. Not subjectively, but objectively and say, this is what the Bible says. And let me just say this, every time I talk to somebody... I don't tell them my opinion when it comes to who Jesus Christ is. I said, here's what the Bible says. This is what you need to do too. I want people to go to the source of truth, the only source of truth there is, to see for yourself. Because remember, who brings conviction in a person's life? Who reveals who Christ is in their life? The Holy Spirit of God. That's what Jesus said. He's the one who's going to come reveal who Christ is. He points to Christ and he tells people about who Christ is through the spoken word. And who does he use? He uses people like us to go and proclaim. And that's unfortunate because there's so many people today who want to hide under a rock. They, they feel like they're so inadequate. They feel like, you know, I'm intimidated to go and share my testimony and tell people about Christ. And this. Well, why is that? Remember what your God did for you and me? He hung on the cross naked. You don't think there was shame on our God? To hang on the cross for you and me. And we just in our little comfortable clothes and our little comfortable arena in our richest country in the whole world and we just can't tell people about Jesus? Let me just say that the worst thing people would ever experience in this life is rejection. And y'all know what that feels like, right? Who wants to be rejected? I don't want to be rejected. I want people to like me. Well, let me just say this. As a follower of Christ... I'm called to do what? I'm called to proclaim what is true concerning people's souls. Any Christ. So you're going to be rejected. Why? Because the cross is offensive. So you might as well fess up to it. What your God did for you and what he did for me, he didn't say, well, Tony, you know what? Because you're not smart enough, because you don't look good enough, because you just, you know, you're old and, you know, you're just getting sloppy at your work and all kind of other things. You're just forgetting a lot of things and everything. I'm just going to give up on you now. Because I'm going to go somebody who's a little smarter and a little better looking. But that's not our God of the Bible, right? I might tell myself that. Some other people might tell me that. But that's not what the Bible says. I'm, I'm forever loved by Jesus Christ. You are forever loved by Jesus Christ. And as a Christian, you are forever forgiven because of his shed blood. So how can I deny and not share Christ with others? Why do I have to be told to do that? Why do sometimes I feel like, you know, it's so uncomfortable to tell people about Christ? You know why? Because you might be ashamed. Maybe it's because you're not a Christian. I don't know. You know, I always use this story. I used to say that young people, young, especially young girls, when they'd find their boyfriend and they were so in love with him, first thing they would do is go tell all their little girlfriends about that boy they were in love with. Guys don't do that because we're too macho. We don't go around that. We don't want to want to steal our girl. That's why we don't say it. But girls go out and they say, you know, oh, he's so good looking. He's so smart. He's so handsome. You know, 
they're so in love with them. They just talk about them all the time. I, I really appreciate it about women. Guys don't do that. But you see, why don't we do that about Christ? That, you know, men think that they're so macho and they don't have to do that. Well, wait a minute. Jesus Christ was the most macho man. I don't want to use that because in, in a way that would, you know, degrade, deg degrade him. But the fact is, he was the man of mans. He was 100% man. But you know what? He was also 100% God and never at one time did he ever lose his deity. And yet he continued to be man. He was a man's man. He was somebody you could follow. He was somebody you can imitate. I mean, you know, young men are looking for people to mentor them. Let me just tell you this. You fall in love with Christ, you've got the mentor of mentors. You know, today we want to follow superstars. We've got American idols. We've got all these people doing all these fancy, talented things, which... Yeah, I just look at that and I'm saying, oh, man, so talented. And today, what do we do? We worship them. When they're going to die, they're a sinner. They can never save you. See, we worship the one who has all the money. You know, Bloomberg's running up there in New York. He was going to be shutting that money all over the place and winning his votes, right? You think all these people are going to be thinking about how smart he is? No, they're going to be thinking about all that money he's got. But you see, here's the thing, folks. I already know the one who owns the cattle of a thousand hills. <laughs> I already know who owns everything. And guess what? That's part of my inheritance. <laughs> And you know what else is true about that? Every one of you who are a believer in Christ have that same measure of inheritance. You got it all. So what's the big deal if I got to go buy a lottery ticket, buy another lottery ticket, buy another lottery ticket, taken of the false hope that I put in money, false security that I have in money or people which will always disappoint me, rather than transitioning to the one who was the Word made flesh, who created everything, who has everything, who needs nothing, who is a, the, the self-existing one. Well, you, you want to know someone like him? That's the one you want to know. Who's got it all? And it's not so much to say to have it all, it's to know him. And to have fellowship with him. And to walk with him. And have the privilege of having eternal security in him. Folks, it's not about heaven. It's not about where you're going to be in heaven. It's not about how much money or how many things you're going to own in heaven. It's not going to be about the gold streets. It's not going to be about the pearly gates. It's not going to be about any of those things. You know what it's going to be about for me? It's being wherever Jesus is, that's where I want to be. Forget about all that stuff. Wherever he is, that's where I want to be. Why? Because he, there's nobody that's going to top him. He's the God of all gods. He's the one that John is talking about here. He's the one who's relating through the word who he is, through the infinite, through the powerful word of God, who Jesus Christ is, lest we take for granted who the person of Christ is. In Colossians chapter 1. I just got to get this verse in too. There's, uh, there's others here, but let me just get Colossians 1, 15 through 16. Paul says this, He is the image of the invisible God. Now, let me just stop right here for a second and give you a little feedback on what, what's happening to Paul. Paul is in a prison when he's writing this. It's one of his prison epistles. Now, you know what? If I'm in prison... I don't know if I'd be thinking about all this, much less wanting to relate to other people who the infinite God is, because I'd be thinking, man, all I want to do is get out of here. 
It's not like what we have here in the, in the parish or in other places. You know, other people can go to these special prisons and, they, and where, where there's not so bad, you know, and got color TV, air conditioning, three meals a day, exercise. Man, they got, they got gyms in the gym now. I mean, gyms in the prison now. Gyms in the gym? I never heard of that. But they got gyms in the prisons. So, I mean, they got it all there. See, they didn't have that there. You had to contest with the rats and how they would eat your own food or you'd eat them and everything else that accompanied living in a cesspool. And here he is pinning down one of the most marvelous words in the scriptures pertaining to the one and only true God who could deliver him forever and ever. And he's wanting to tell other people about it. He's not thinking about himself. He's wanting to tell people about Jesus right there in that prison, that rotten, infested, rat-infested prison. And he says, he, that's Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, now, now just remember, Jesus was never born into existence. <coughs> he was the first, he was the only one who was born of a virgin and lived a sinless life. Talking about his birth, his humanity. But the firstborn of all creation, for notice, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. <laughs> Who do you think's the boss? <laughs> He's the boss. So he makes that clear. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the Word. He reveals himself. He's revealed himself. And to this day, he still is revealing himself. Praise God. And so secondly, the second point here this morning, Jesus, the agent of creation. I kind of like went over some of that stuff already with you. But now it's like, it's just, John can't help himself. You've got to keep talking about who this creator God is. And he says, the work, or rather, the second point, sub point of that is the work of the word. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Okay, well, let's go back to our text in the scriptures. 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 3. He says, by faith. Now, again, the only way you're going to understand the Scriptures is simply by believing them. God didn't make it difficult, right? So, the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. Okay? For what reason? So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So in other words, when God created all these things, He didn't borrow from any kind of substance or anything else from anywhere else in the universe. He just simply did what? Spoke it into existence. We've got to go to Job. So, for the remainder, just we're almost through here. But Job chapter 26, I want you to turn there in the Old Testament. And uh, it's right before the book of Psalms. Job chapter 26. Let's start in verse 1. The oldest book in the Bible. Now, Job didn't have a Bible. <laughs> Job didn't know that at one time all these things had happened, and we'll see this in a second. What he saw was simply he trusted, he just simply believed God and trusted Him by faith, the same way that we're told to do today. But verse 1, you can imagine how much harder it was for him. Verse 1 says, Then Job answered and said, How have you helped him who has no power? Or how have you saved the arm that has no strength? How have you counseled him who has no wisdom and plentifully declared sound knowledge? With whose help have you uttered words and whose breath has come out from you? The dread tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God. And Abaddon has no covering. 
Look at verse 7. He says, He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. Now, how did he know that? How did he know that the earth was just going through this solar system and there was no strings attached to it? How did he know that? <laughs> Who was the guy who, who uh, was the guy who discovered gravity? What, the, what was his name? Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. But it was for a telescope before he discovered gravity. He said, the earth hangs on nothing. He binds up the waters in thick clouds, and the cloud is not split under them. He covers the face of the moon and spreads over its, its cloud. You know, the moon, boy, it was beautiful this week. I got to see it coming so bright, full moon. And, and the only way it can, it can have that shininess and that brightness is it gets it from the sun. Without the sun, it wouldn't have that brightness. So he's describing what he's seeing in the heavens. He's describing the clouds. He's seeing how the, all that water that falls to the earth in those clouds, you're thinking, that's just vapor. But how does all that water fall? So much water at one time. In other areas, sometimes they'll fall. Flood areas. Just, a, just a little clouds carrying moisture. How does that happen? Verse 10, and he, and he has inscribed a circle on the face of the earth of the waters and the boundary between light and darkness. You know when you're at the beach and you can see the water on the horizon, you see the sky meets it, right? It just proves this. God kept them separated from each other. And he continues to do that. So many things. The pillars of the heavens tremble and, the, and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he, he stilled the sea and, and by his understanding shattered Rahab. By his wind the heavens were made fair, and by his hand pierced a fleeing serpent. Behold, these are but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Who can understand? And let's hurry up and go back to John chapter 1, verse 10. Listen to what John says. We'll cover that in the upcoming weeks. He says, verse 10, John 1, 10, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He walked among them. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, if Jesus would walk on this earth right now, man, that would be great, wouldn't it? You wouldn't know him either. You know, there are angels who visit this earth, don't you? You may have seen an angel, but you don't know it. I thought I had seen an angel one day. <laughs> In fact, two of them, but he had, it was two Mormons on a bike. Each had a bike. Now, I didn't, uh, there are things that happen in our lives we probably can't explain, right? But you know, this is a spiritual realm that none of us know anything about except what the Word tells us. And yet we have people write books and all kinds of stuff talking about how they've been to heaven, they've been here and they've been there and done all this and done all that and they're selling these books and making millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. When Paul, at one time, he went into heaven, the Bible says, God told him not to say anything about it. And yet we have people who are blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God by writing these books. John is making it clear. Here he is. He was the one in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And to this day, there are still people who don't know who Christ is. They may know him with a head knowledge, but not with a heart knowledge. And then thirdly here this morning, Jesus, the agents of eternal life. The conflict of the word. Oh, there's conflict. There's conflict today. But here it is. Verse 4 says, In him was life, and the light, and the life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You ever notice that? 
You can be in the darkest of the darkest place. And if you turn a flashlight on, darkness has got to flee. That's what he's talking about. And, and, and in a more direct sense, he's talking about even though there's a lot of darkness in this world, evil, it will never overcome the conqueror, the victorious one, Jesus Christ. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's go back to First John, and we're almost through here. So you're always on safe grounds when you interpret the Bible with the Bible. And so I'm not just pulling verses because I you know, just want to make a good conversation or make a good argument. I'm taking the Word of God and I'm interpreting the Word of God with the Word of God. And that ought to be a lesson. Any one of you who decides, decides or has a desire to study the Word of God, and we should all be, always interpret the Word with the Word. So 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 11 says, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. You know, and sometimes people will justify whatever sin they're living in because they feel like it's, you know, it's a benevolent thing to do. But, but remember, when you violate what the word says, then it's wrong. It's, it's God's Word. You, I mean, you might break it, but remember, there will always be consequences for violating the Word of God. So verse 7 says, Beloved, I'm writing, so get, again, the, the appeal here. You, you notice the intimate, intimate appeal here. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old one that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the Word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining, which will never be snuffed out. What is that true light? Well, verse 9, whoever says that he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Boy, isn't that a lesson, huh? Did I say that a while ago? Well, that's what the Word says, right? If you hate your brother... The one who says he's a Christian, you hate them? Well, then darkness is in you. You're not, a, you're not a believer. Verse 10, whoever hates, no, who, I'm sorry, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother, notice, is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eye. And that's the person who believes a lie and thinks it is truth. That's the person who says they can have their cake and eat it too. They can live a sinful life opposed to the scriptures and know it and knowingly know it's wrong, but yet at the same time justify it with some kind of benevolent action. There's no way you can justify sin before God who is holy. Any more than when their day, in walking in their day, saying to John, John, we, we hear what you're saying, but we just don't believe it. We hear, we hear what you're saying about the low gods, but you see, it just does not compute according to our standards, our lifestyle. Oh. I think that's what happens. You see, it's where does Jesus fit in my lifestyle that I can say that he's Lord and not the, other, not, the, not the other way around. You see, when it should be, he's the Lord of my life and I love him and I must obey what he says, whatever the cost that might be. It might cost you reputation. It may even cost your life. I don't know. But, but see, that's besides the point. What, Paul, what, what John is doing, what the Holy Spirit of God and what the Father and what Jesus wanted him to do, he wanted him to reveal who the Word was. To explain who Christ is to a generation that's dying. 
I've heard a bunch of deaths this week. And the only thing I could think of was this. How many of them went into eternity with Christ? How many of them went into eternity without Christ? I don't know. I have no way of telling that. I can't, I don't know. But, but, the, but the question is, am, am I doing my part to tell other people about how they can have deliverance from darkness, from hell and the grave, and have forgiveness for their sins? That's my job. And not because I'm a preacher. It's because I'm a called out one. You know what, Christian? You are also a called out one. Amen. You're to do the same thing. And if you're not doing it, well, shame on you. Shame on you. And, and I would say this, if you're not doing it, then why not? And I also would say this, if you need, you need to ask God to examine your heart to see whether or not you are truly a Christian. A believer. Born again. Because life is coming. You know, it's here. Jesus is here. Life is here. It's available. Eternity. Life in Christ is here now. The kingdom of Jesus would tell the folks in Matthew, he would say, Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, now's the time to be saved. Now's the time to bow your heart to the one who's only the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, who's God, who's Lord of Lords, and King of Kings. He's the one you pay your allegiance to. He's the one who you serve. But you know what I find? There are people who are following the wrong Jesus. They're not following the Jesus of the Bible. They don't have a clear understanding who He is. So see, again, it's not up to me to save people. It's up to me to proclaim who, we, who Christ is. Now, it doesn't, stop for, it doesn't fall short of that. Not only does it, not only does it say, Paul's, John's saying, you know, who is this Jesus? He's the Word made flesh. But it's also this. Once you find out who He is, then what are you supposed to be doing? <laughs> so again, reiterate, Jesus is the Word who is the divine agent of revelation. Everything goes through Him. Jesus is the Word who is the divine agent of creation. Everything had to go through Him. Jesus is the Word who is the divine agent of eternal life. In other words, there's no other way to go to heaven but through Him. Forget about all these other people to tell Him. Even though they might have a lot of money and they may be smart and get all this stuff going for them, talents and everything else, let me tell you, do you go with the Word says? Jesus Christ is the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only life. He's the only way to go to heaven. And poor old Thomas. Old Thomas, remember Doubting Thomas? Remember when he was up in the upper room and all the disciples said, no, Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive and he's, you know, he's walking the earth. And, and old Thomas said, oh, he says, unless I put my hands in his side and, 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 and in his hands and, and no... Unless I, unless I see him tangibly, I see him physically, bodily, I will not believe. A little doubt of, doubting Thomas. And what happened when Jesus just went through that wall and stood before those disciples? And there was Thomas. And what did Thomas say? One of the greatest statements, and I got to give him this. Because I think that's the, that, that is, the, that, that is the, the, the verbal explanation that every sinner must say. And it's this. My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, come touch, come touch the nail prints of my head. Come touch your hands in my head. He said, oh no. He just simply said and worshipped him, my Lord and my God. An atheist unable to meet Christian's challenge. In the 19th century, Charles Bradlaugh, a prominent atheist, challenged a Christian man to debate the validity of the claims of Christianity. The Christian was Hugh Prince Hughes, an active soul winner who worked among the poor in the slums of London. Hughes told Bradlaugh, he would agree to the debate on one condition. Hugh said, 
I propose to you that we each bring some concrete evidences of the validity of our beliefs in the form of men and women who have been redeemed from the lives of sin and shame by the influence of our teaching. I will bring a hundred such men and women, and I challenge you to do the same. Hughes then said that if Bradlaugh couldn't bring a hundred men, then he could bring twenty. He finally whittled out the number down to one. All Bradlaugh had to do was to find one person whose life was improved by atheism. And Hughes, who would bring a hundred people improved by Christ, would agree to debate him. Bradlaugh withdrew. I think that's where the rubber meets the road, doesn't it? If you can find anyone better than Jesus Christ to follow and obey, then prove it. And he did to this atheist, and this atheist simply said, huh, Uncle, I can't. By my own teachings, by my own beliefs, about that there's no God that exists, I can't lay any claims to the fact that my life is improved as a result of that. Or should I say my life became more obedient towards the things of God. What saith you today about the word that was made flesh on our behalf that you and I might not only have our sins forgiven, but also we might have fellowship and communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one greater than him. There's no one more powerful. There's no one who can love you more than he does right now. If you're willing to bow your heart to him. Would you stand please?